Lecture 29, Armenius and German Mythology. Four times in the 19th and 20th century, French and German armies clashed. The defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo was the product of both the British and the Prussians. And it is said that in the most critical hours of the battle, General Wellington prayed that either nightfall would come and the French would have to break off their attack, or General Blücher and his Prussian troops would arrive. The Prussians did arrive, and Napoleon met his Waterloo. The successor, the little Napoleon as he was called, the French Emperor Napoleon III, met his own Waterloo at the Battle of Sedan. In 1870 and 1871, Prussians and French clashed again, and the result was the fall of the empire of Napoleon III and the proclamation of a united Germany in the palace at Versailles, what the French thought was their ultimate humiliation. Again, in 1914, France and Germany for four long years clashed in what till then was the greatest war in history. And the, Brit and the French held. At Verdun, they wrote the immortal words, they shall not pass. And they held the Germans, suffering more than a million dead in the long war, but they won. And in 1939, it started all over again. France and Germany at war. And in 1940, the Germans marched in triumph down the Champs-Élysées. And France has never recovered from that defeat by the Germans. Why? Why four times in two centuries did perhaps the two most cultivated people in Europe well-educated, prosperous, why did they come to war? And to answer that question, we need to turn to some heroes, to some history, and to some myths. And to do that, I want you to go back with me to the year 9 AD. And we are in Rome. We are on the Palatine Hill where Romulus first established the city of Rome. We are in the modest house of Caesar Augustus, Imperator Caesar Dewi Filius Augustus. The name might be translated the all-conquering general, Caesar, the son of God, who was Julius Caesar, and Augustus. And the best English translation is the Messiah. If we want a superb example of the foresight of Julius Caesar, it was the adoption of his great-nephew, Gaius Octavius. Caesar knew very little about the youth, though he had been responsible for his education. But in his will, Caesar adopted the boy, who was 19 at the time, and left him most of his estate, which was vast, far larger than the Roman treasury. And the boy interrupted his studies against the advice of his mother. At the age of 19, he had been studying in Greece. He came to Italy when he learned of his now father's assassination, Julius Caesar's assassination, raised an army of Caesar's veterans, and by 29 B.C., was absolute master of the world. He was one of the most successful, perhaps the most successful statesman in history. It was said by um, an English philosopher, Whitehead, that two times in the history of the world was a very difficult, complex political problem solved in as nearly a perfect a fashion as possible. One was the founders of our country and our constitution, but the other and earlier was what Augustus did with the Roman Empire. All the dreams that Caesar had, Julius Caesar, 
Caesar Augustus put into place. He knew his limits. He added more to the Roman Empire than any Roman before him or after him, but he very seldom fought battles on his own. He did not seek after the title king. He was happy with the title princeps, and he instituted an era of two centuries of unparalleled peace and prosperity. By the year 9 AD, he is 72 years of age. He has had sorrow in his life. His grandsons, whom he loved deeply and thought of as his successors, had died. And he now had had to turn to his stepson, an adopted son, Tiberius, whom Augustus knew to be unworthy of imperial power, but there seemed to be no other possible successor. But that's not what is on his mind this day on the 9 AD. He is worried about events in Germany. Julius Caesar had planned to lead a great expedition starting on April 15th, 44 BC, conquer Iran and then conquer Germany. Julius Caesar understood that Iran and Central Europe were the keys to maintaining Roman peace. But he was assassinated, and Augustus had chosen a different path in the Middle East. He understood the strategic vitality of the Middle East. In fact, the Middle East uh, was crucial to the wheat supply of Rome, even as the Middle East is crucial to our oil supply today. Thus, Augustus had annexed the province of Judea, but he had not made war against Iran. And in fact, in 19 BC, he had negotiated a peaceful settlement by which Romans and Iranian recognized mutual spheres of influence. But it was different in Germany. There, Augustus thought he could succeed. And his, really his favorite adopted son, Germanicus, uh, Nero Claudius Drusus, given the title Germanicus posthumously, in 15 BC led a series of very successful invasions into Germany, crossing the Rhine River, which was the boundary, really, between the Roman provinces of Gaul and free Germany. And by 9 BC, it looked as though Drusus would bring this to a completion and force all of the German tribes to surrender, pay tribute to Rome, even as the Gauls had done. But he fell from his horse in 9 BC while on campaign in Germany, and for some years Augustus had let the matter rest. But by 9 AD, Augustus believed that the Germans had been sufficiently cowed that they would begin to accept regular Roman rule. That is to say, they would, as the Gauls had done, pay tribute, taxes, have provincial governors, be subject to Roman law, begin to build towns the way the Gauls had, had done, begin to adopt Roman ways, even wearing the toga and speaking Latin. And a number of Germans had, in fact, enlisted in the Roman army, uh, one of the achievements of Augustus was to regularize, regularize the Roman army, and there was half the army were Roman citizens, the other half was auxiliary forces made up of non-Romans who served for 25 years, and at the end of that time, they, their wives, their children, all received Roman citizenship. And a number of Romans had taken that route. So there were numerous Roman citizens across the Rhine. One of these was Arminius, a member of the tribe of the Cheruscii. He had served with such distinction in the Roman army that when he retired, he was granted not only Roman citizenship, but the high rank of being an equestrian, the rank just below that of being a senator. And it meant, theoretically, that he could even govern a province like Egypt. And he had adopted, seemingly, all the ways of the Romans, wearing a toga, speaking excellent Latin. But in his heart, 
he remained a German. And starting in about 8 AD, he began to go from tribe to tribe because that was the weakness of the Germans. They were divided into a number of different tribes, fiercely warlike and fiercely independent. Some like the tribe of the Ubii, around the city of what we now call Cologne, had become very Romanized. But the Cheruskii were still at a stage where Romanization was only gradually creeping in among them. And some, like the Marcomanii, what we would call Bohemia today, under their war chief Marobodas, were staunchly retaining their Germanic ways. But Arminius went to each of the tribes, and he spoke to them, spoke to them in their Germanic tongue. Are you willing to become slaves of the Romans? Quintilius Varus has been appointed as governor by the Caesar in Rome. He's related to Caesar himself. He is a man of poor judgment, weak character. But such is the contempt that the Caesar has for you that he has sent out this Varus, not to conquer, but to reap the fruits of conquest. They believe, said Arminius, as he stood within the holy oak trees and great soaring pine trees of the Germans, they believe that we are now so weak that we will speak Latin, wear the toga, send our children to their schools, become like the Gauls across the river, slaves of Rome. Are we? And suddenly he ripped off his toga. He had on the full war paint of a German. Are we going to become slaves of the Romans? Let us unite for once. Let all of us, the Cheruski, the Chattii, the Sucumbari, the Marcomanii, the Bucteri, let us all come together. Let us swear an oath here to our ancient gods, that we will fight the Romans, that we will rise up against Varus. And they swore an oath, and Arminius became their war chief to lead them in this rebellion. But it had to be planned carefully. And the Roman author Valius Perturculus, an admirer of Tiberius, the emperor who succeeded Augustus, and a general, a Tiberius who had fought with some success against the Germans in his earlier days, Valius Paterculus said, they are as brave as they are treacherous. They are born to be liars, these Germans. And so it was by treachery, treason, lies, that Quintilius Varus was led to believe by Arminius, who posed as his friend, after all, he's a Roman citizen, an equestrian, a decorated veteran of the Roman army. Arminius came to Varus and said, now is the time. We Germans are ready to pay taxes as loyal citizens of this mighty empire. And all you need to do is to come further into Germany. Show with a display of strength, bring three legions, and you will find yourself welcomed and town after town and tribe after tribe will open its gates to you. Well, there were some other Germans there at the governor's palace. They tried to caution Varus against the treachery of Armenius. But Varus, a man of very poor judgment, decided of course he could trust this Armenius. After all, as later would be said, blonde hair and blue eyes are the eternal opposite a falsehood. Thus, with three legions, the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th, Varus, accompanied by Arminius, began his march into Germany. Now, Germany had not been civilized in the sense of the kind of Roman roads that the armies were used to marching over. And the German summer is a very brutal summer, day after day of rain and chill, and the little paths that went through the forest of Germany uh, became muddy 
And of course, the Roman army did not travel lightly. It brought with it large numbers of baggage trains, wagons, supplies. You had to feed the horses, feed the oxen who drew the wagons. So it was extended over many miles, and the muddy pathways were impossible to cross. Romans had to use their engineering skill to chop down trees and create what we used to call in America corduroy roads, roads that are roll over uh, logs. But on they marched. The further they got into Germany, the uh, more it seemed that this, uh, the expedition was going to be successful. Each of the tribes submitted and asked indeed that Roman soldiers be left behind, detachments of up to three or four hundred men, in order to protect them from any Germans who might want to attack them because they were helping the Romans. So Varus cut off a number of his troops and left them stationed in garrisons as he went further and further into Germany. And then one day Arminius was gone. But he told Varus that he was leaving because he wanted to go even further among the German tribes, spread the word among tribes that had not yet accepted Roman rule of what a good thing it was to be a Roman. And he also wanted to bring those troops to uh, Varus so that they could be part of his entourage in case he did run into any hostile tribes. So Varus had given permission for Armenius to go. And he also, Varus, failed to note that a considerable number of the Germanic warriors who had been accompanying him had gone away. But the explanation, again, was presented and most logical that they were going to check on their families and they would be back and even bring some of their children with them so they could be taken back into uh, Roman Gaul and educated to be good Romans. And so the Romans marched on. The skies opened up upon them, and it rained day after day after day. Suddenly, as the Romans pushed on, Varus growing ever a little more nervous, as his loyal Germans told him, something is up, but to turn back would be a humiliation. It would certainly get back to the Emperor Augustus. Uh, Varus was married to the grand niece of Augustus, and he might lose his position. After all, he was a bureaucrat, and a little wor worse thing for a bureaucrat is to seem to admit failure. On they pushed. <coughs> Out of those woods came the Germans, outnumbering the Romans five, six to one, completely surrounding the Roman column, and the Romans, as they had been marching, had become ever more drawn out in their lines, straggling cut off from their units. And in this pouring rain, their weapons failed to work. The centurions, the, really, the, men, the men who really ran the Roman army, they tried to rally their troops, tried to put them together in their units, their cohorts, their legions, but it was impossible. Everywhere were Germans, and they were hurling javelins upon the Romans. And from his experience in the Roman army, Arminius fully understood Roman tactics and understood how, if a legion could form up with its shield, shield next to shield next to shield, it was invincible. But once the Roman legionnaire was cut off, once he was having to fight individually, then he was at a great disadvantage, weighed down by heavy armor. The Germans wore almost no armor, and the Germans could throw their javelins at the Romans, then close with spears that were 16 foot long. The Roman trusted in his javelin. Roman could kill at 75 yards with a javelin throw. But to reach that distance, the Roman had to make use of a special uh, leather halter on the javelin that gave him purchase to throw far. And in the pouring rain, that uh, lever was absolutely worthless, and the Roman could get no more than 15 or 20 yards with a javelin. The Roman was also the master of the short sword, two feet long, liked to close with that short sword while marching in close formation with shields protecting every Roman. But what good was a two-foot sword when you were by yourself 
And your German opponent, or maybe two or three of them, had 16-foot spears. Thus, all that long day, the Romans were bloodied and killed. They built a camp, and inside that camp, made of turf, sentries set out. They spent that long night, and they heard outside their camp the cries of their comrades. For the Germans loved to torture. And the braver you were, the more they tortured you. They took Romans and drove nails into their heads as they hung from trees. They liked to take the bravest of the warriors and spread them out on an altar and fillet them while they were still alive. Pull their backbones out offering them up as sacrifices to their fierce gods, to Odin, to Thor, the god of the thunder, to Freya, the goddess who was the goddess of fertility and the wife of Odin, and to Tu, the god of war. Ah, they still speak to us every week, do they not? Tuesday, the day of Tu. Wednesday, the day of Odin. Thursday, the day of Thor, and Friday, the day of Freya. So the torture went on all night, and the screams, Brother, you're in the camp. Brother, can you come help me? Don't let them, don't let them do this to me. And a number of Romans were simply thrown down into pits so they could be kept for torturing later. And when the sun rose, it was on a scene of absolute horror. You saw your best friend nailed to a tree. What to do? If we stay here, we'll be killed. We've got to try to find our way out. And for a second day and a third day, the Romans made their way back towards the Rhine. And Arminius let them go because he was gathering ever more tribesmen, collecting the various tribes who had sat on the sidelines, wondering what would happen. And now when they saw the Romans in retreat, they too joined this coalition of Germanic tribes. And on the fourth day, as the rain grew ever heavier, the Germans attacked one final time. Overwhelming the Romans, the Romans unable to fight in this land of nothing but trees. The Germans knew how to use the trees for cover, to hurl their javelins out from the trees. But the Romans just found it a, an impossible maze, falling over the roots of the trees, the rain bringing down huge tree limbs upon them. Also, they were burdened by the fact that many Roman soldiers traveled with a wife and several children. And their women and children were crying and screaming. In fact, it was the crying and screaming of the children that was most terrifying until as that last bloody day came to its end. Romans one by one began to ask their comrade, kill me, don't let me be captured by those Germans. And it's very difficult. You can try it sometime to stab yourself with a two-foot sword. What the Romans did is for your comrade to hold the sword, and you ran upon it. So it was done until there was only one man left among a group of comrades, and he would fix his sword down into the ground and fall upon it. Quintilius Varus himself committed suicide rather than fall into these ferocious hands. And when Augustus received the word, 9 AD, he tore his garments off, his toga, his white toga. Varus, Varus, give me back my legions. For three legions, more than 15,000 men with their sacred battle flags had been killed and captured. And for the rest of his life, he would don black robes on the day of that terrible defeat at a place called the Teutoburg Forest. After he passed and his will was read aloud, 
And in it, he wrote, make no further effort to expand the empire. Leave Germany alone. But Tiberius, giving in to the wishes of his adopted son, Germanicus, the son of Drusus, Germanicus, who had campaigned successfully in Germany, Drusus, uh, uh, Germanicus, the adopted son of Tiberius and very popular with the Roman people, as he had been much beloved by Augustus, asked for permission to campaign in Germany. And in 15 AD, the first full year of the reign of Tiberius, Germanicus led a large army into Germany. And the Germans withdrew, letting him get further and further until he came upon the spot of the Teutoburg Forest and the scene of horror. Bones lying there for six years. Bones and trees of Roman soldiers with nails in their head. Romans stretched out on altars with a backbone separated from the rest of the body. You could still recognize, perhaps, from a special decoration he wore, lying there in the dirt, your brother, even your father. They were buried with full military honors and a mound erected over them to honor their bravery. But like Varus, Germanicus had been led far into Germany, and Arminius led another attack upon him. And it was with great difficulty that the Romans fought their way back to the city we call Cologne and to the safety of the Rhine River. The next year, Germanicus got permission to lead a further expedition. This time he thought he could save time and perhaps outflank the Germans by taking most of his troops by sea through the North Sea. Once again he landed. His other columns joined him up, having marched deep into Germany. And once again, they were attacked by this coalition led by, led by Arminius. Germanicus claimed great victories, but in the end, part of his army marched back by land, almost destroyed, and the rest of it sailed back and encountered the brutal summer storms of the North Sea. And hundreds, if not thousands, of Romans drowned. At this final disaster, Tiberius removed Germanicus from command in Germany, gave him a triumph in Rome, and sent him off to the Middle East. And from that time on, Germany would be free. Tacitus, the Roman historian of the late 1st and uh, early 2nd century A.D., Publius Cornelius Tacitus, admired the Germans and admired Arminius. Tacitus wrote a monograph, an essay, on the Germans in which he contrasted the chastity of their wives and husbands, their love of warfare, their belief in their gods who did not need temples to dwell in, contrasted the virtue of the Romans, or the virtue of the Germans, their warlike qualities, with the decadent Romans of his own day, who thought adultery was just a casual affair of the heart and no longer had the warlike valor of the men who had fought at Zama with Scipio. And to Tacitus, the Germans would one day, because of their bravery, conquer the Roman Empire. And all that would save Rome in the meantime was the disunity among the German tribes. Arminius fell to that disunity. He was accused of aiming at total kingship over the Germans and was murdered by treachery. Tacitus paid him the highest tribute. Arminius was without doubt the liberator of Germany. Unconquered in battle, he alone went against the Roman Empire, not in its early days, 
but when it was in the full tide of its imperial might. He is still sung about by the Germanic bards around their campfires. He was the greatest enemy the Romans ever faced and the only ones to beat the Romans in a war.